special prayers this morning as I'm going to be dealing with a sensitive subject that has the potential to be divisive. And, it, well, the subject has already caused significant division, and I don't want to add to that, but I do think it's uh, important and it's something we need to talk about. Uh, and it's the issue of women's ordination. Now, if you're visiting Granite Bay today, we know we have people here from uh, not only other Seventh-day Adventist churches, but from a broad spectrum of different religious backgrounds, or none, that come to visit. You might wonder, well, what's this all about? Uh, over the last, oh, 50, 60 years or so, a number of the mainline uh, denominations have gone through a, a lot of struggles regarding their identity and the roles of men and women. It's been something that's been addressed by the Methodists and the, the Presbyterians and the Anglicans and the Lutherans and a number of others. And now this issue is at the door of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Different churches have responded in different ways. And uh, we need to make sure what we do, we do from the Bible. We are a Bible-based church. And so our church, in the general conference, our organization meets once every five years. And they gather together in different parts of the world, typically in North America. And this year they're going to be gathering in uh, San Antonio and going to be talking about this subject, among other issues. Namely, should women be ordained as pastors in the same way as men? And some people might think, well, that's a self-evident truth. Others are not so sure. And I just would like to share with you what the Bible reasons are for what the church has believed for its last 150 years. And this may be um, the biggest crisis our church has faced in its 150-year history because it as I said, has proven already to be very divisive. This subject, and understanding the subject of women's ordination, it evolves around a large word called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics are the principles that a person uses when they read and study and understand the Bible. And in order to come to the conclusion, in my opinion, that there is no difference between men and women biblically and that women should be ordained as pastors the same way men are requires the Seventh-day Adventist to really change the hermeneutics that we use, the Bible study principles that have really brought us into being. And that's why this is such an important subject. Well, I know I've got a list of notes here. I've titled the message today, The Adventist Ordination Crisis Part 1. There may only be one part. That'll be dependent on how the Spirit leads. But just in case, I said part one. And I, I won't keep you here through the first half of the millennium. But uh, where I normally have one pages of notes, I have ten today. So you may want to fast and pray during the sermon. <laughs> just to give you context for why I think this is a, a very serious issue. I've got a lot of scripture I've just printed out here, so don't be as frightened. Some of you know about a week ago, Ireland voted to uh, reevaluate their constitution so that it would permit same-sex marriage. About a year ago, or less than a year ago, the governor in California voted to be the first state in the nation to allow boys and girls to access bathrooms and locker rooms of their choice. Now, it used to be where, in a world of common sense, you'd say, something's wrong with that. I'm happy to report that Nevada and Florida and other states have voted down those bills, but California, we thought it was a good idea. People in North America are celebrating a TV program where one man has four wives and sisters at that. And um, additional states are exploring the possibility of legalizing polygamy because they figure that if marriage should be love between two caring people, then what difference does it matter if it's three caring people? The very same arguments that are being used to support same-sex marriage are being used now, I mean, it's all the same logic, to defend three people being married or four people or any other combination. And about a year ago, Texas State Representative Mary Gonzalez broke a number of barriers. Not only was she the first openly lesbian lawmaker when she was elected to Texas, but she announced the Huffington Post 
that, um, and to Dallas Voice, rather, that she instead now identifies herself as pansexual. Pansexuals don't believe in any gender binary. Hence, they can be attracted to all genders and everything in between. Any of you remember a little quote that said, boys are snips and snails and puppy dogs' tails, and girls are sugar, what is it, and spice, and everything nice. Am I the only one that longs for the days when there was a clear distinction between boys and girls, and we thought that was a good thing? You know, uh, I remember last baptism I performed at Sacramento Central Church. Uh, I was feeling a little depressed that day because when I put my suit on that morning, it was exceptionally tight. And you know, they say that you will be the heaviest you ever are in your life about 60 years of age. And so to me, it just was a bad harbinger. But I felt better when after the baptism I was changing and I realized that somehow I had mixed up Nathan's suit with my suit. We have two. Karen bought us two identical suits. And the reason I was struggling that day is because I was wearing the suit of an 18-year-old. And I thought, yes, here I am. 58 years old, 20 years at the same church, and I'm wearing, it's like being able to get back in your wedding dress, right? I'm wearing the suit of an 18-year-old. But then I had another experience that wasn't near as encouraging, is I went to put on my pants one day, my jeans, and I knew right away something was dreadfully wrong. Somehow, I found out that Karen's jeans were not that different, you know, in height, and it, her jeans ended up in my drawer. And what really bothered me was there's a verse in the Bible that says in Deuteronomy 22, a man shall not wear that which pertains to a woman, and a woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man, for all that do so are an abomination. Now why does God say that? It doesn't say whether the, cro the, the clothing is expensive. It doesn't have anything to do with being ostentatious. It doesn't say whether or not the clothing is modest or not. It says they're not to even be like each other. There should be a very clean and decisive difference between... Boy, I couldn't wait to get those pants off, I'll tell you what. As soon as I realized, I just looked around hoping nobody had seen this. Because I thought, I don't want to be an abomination. <laughs> the Bible says there should be very clean, clear distinctions in our culture and in our church between men and women. Well, right now we are facing a crisis. And the crisis has to do with how are we going to read the Bible in the future. Because I think in order for us to adopt the new gender neutral sort of a unisex theology that is being taught in order to adopt um, women's ordination, it is going to affect every one of our other doctrines. Because it will affect how do we read and interpret the Bible. Does the Bible really mean what it says? You know, Jesus said, from the beginning of the creation, this is New Testament, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother, again, father and mother is different, and be joined to his wife. And the two become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Now, this issue of women's ordination presents a crisis because it, it has to do with a crisis of theology. And I'll be going through these in a number of points. It creates a crisis for our mission in evangelism and it's presenting a crisis for unity. You cannot imagine for a moment, I'm hoping, that we can live in a culture that has transgender bathrooms for high school students, where one man is married to four women, where different states are lobbying for same-sex marriage, and none of that is going to have any impact on the values and the culture of the church. Because you and I all live with these people every day that are involved in these things and watch these programs, that thinking is going to start influencing the church culture. But what should define our teachings in the church? Culture or scripture? And so this is why this is, a, I think, a very serious issue. And we need to understand it. Now, the reason I'm sharing this message today is because I believe there are some honest people out there that are still studying the issue that maybe haven't made up their mind. You know, it was, I think, uh, 
Mark Twain that said, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. I remember talking to a friend a few years ago that was absolutely convinced that NASA never did land on the moon, that the whole thing was staged by Hollywood and special effects. Any of you ever run into that before? And no amount of evidence and logic and reason that I could present to them was going to change their mind because they had their mind made up that it was all a big conspiracy. Man has never been on the moon. And there are people that have their minds made up on this issue one way or the other and it's not a question of evidence. But for those who maybe are really wanting to know what does the Bible say? What does history tell us? What does the spirit of prophecy say? That's why I'm sharing these things. And I'm hoping that you'll be praying as I go and that uh, that will be the, the source of our information. Now, I should mention that there, there's a number of good books out on the subject. I just wanted to... I'm not selling books because if you come next week, we'll give every family a free copy of this book. I told you there might be part two, so just in case, you've got to come next week. Also because we didn't remember to bring them today. <laughs> so, uh, I've got one. <laughs> And so come next week, this is a really good book that has been put out by a number of scholars in our church, The Adventist Ordination Crisis, and it's written by men and women, doctors, laymen, uh, PhDs, uh, biblical authority, cultural conformity, Dr. Clint Walleen, who's at the BR Bible Research Institute, and his wife Gina, they just put out a really good book on women's ordination, Does It Matter? Pastor Stephen Bohr has a great book on the subject. Uh, Eugene Pruitt has a great book on the subject. There's a lot of good material out there. And I recommend you study because we need to know what we believe and how to defend what we believe. Now, before I go any farther, please let me explain. This is not a question of women in ministry, as some have tried to frame it. I believe, all of our pastors believe, I think this whole church believes that every man and woman should be involved in ministry. You here know that Amazing Facts has evangelism training programs for men and women. That we employ men and women in evangelism, in teaching, in preaching. We believe everybody should be involved in ministry. So don't say, why are you subjugating women? Or why do you not believe that women should be involved in ministry? I dare say we're doing more to empower women for ministry than many just came back from the Philippines where we had a wonderful evangelistic program and an AFCO, well we call it PAFCO there because it's a Filipino uh, Amazing Facts Evangelism School. And so um, had more women in the class than men. And it's wonderful. We send them out and they do evangelistic programs and we've had thousands of baptisms. So this has nothing to do with whether or not we think women should be involved in ministry. Indeed, the Seventh-day Adventist movement is founded by a woman prophet. But don't miss this very important point. There is a very clear difference biblically, a distinction between someone who is a prophet and a priest. And, for instance, in the Bible, you've got two famous parents their name were Amram and Jochebed. Amram and Jochebed had three unique children. What were their names? Miriam first, then Aaron was second born, then born, then Moses was the third. And Miriam, Aaron, Moses. All three of their children were prophets. Agreed? But only the boys were priests. There is no example in the Bible anywhere of a woman offering sacrifice or serving in the capacity of a priest or a pastor or an elder. And so for us to say, but our culture is so different today, Pastor, I mean, you know, here we're going to have a woman running for president. How could you have the audacity to say that a woman cannot be qualified to serve as an ordained minister of a congregation? It's not what I say, it's what the Bible says. And so if we're going to be, and you know the reason I think it's so important, and I get passionate about this, is my love is evangelism. And I want to make sure that if I'm out there trying to win souls to Christ and bring them into the body of Christ, which is the church, I'm bringing them into a body that believes the Bible. You know, our evangelists out around the world field right now doing meetings, men and women doing evangelism, are sometimes worried, where do we send them when we reach them? Because they're going into churches, and it's not just women's ordination, the churches that don't believe in biblical creation anymore, churches that are promoting things like same-sex marriage, churches that are teaching 
Eastern philosophies of prayer. And there's just a whole bouquet of areas where the culture is causing compromise in our church. And so I think this is a... Uh, and I don't like talking about this issue. I'm an evangelist. I'm a pastor. I love to preach on all different parts of the Bible. But I'm afraid that if I don't say anything now, it's going to be too late. Now is the time for people to stand up and say, we're going to stick with the Bible. What, you know, what's going to happen to some of our doctrines of things like foot washing? If we think that our position on women's ordination is just an ancient cultural tradition, what about foot washing? How long will it be before that falls, by the way? And if it's an idea, for the sake of unity, let us make compromises. If we take that argument, for the sake of unity, let us make compromises of theology, what's that going to do with the Sabbath issue in the future when people say, most Christians go to church on Sunday for the sake of unity? Can you see where this can go? And so if you don't put your feet down somewhere and say, we're going to stick with the Bible no matter what the consequences are. Yes, it might cause some division. Yes, it might cause some, some debate. It might cause some pain. But when the dust settles, we're building on the rock and we will survive the storm. So we need to just stick with what the Word of God says. All right, now with that, uh, first let's talk about do we believe that ordination itself is biblical? One of the interesting arguments I'm hearing the Bible doesn't teach ordination of anything or anybody. Nobody should be ordained. Some are taking a very radical view on that. I don't think you can support that from the Bible. There's a lot of evidence in Scripture of people being ordained. First of all, you've got Aaron, the priest, and his sons were ordained. In John 15, verse 16, Jesus said, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. And the word ordained, you know, we use different words. Ordained means I have set you aside, I have appointed you. So don't get hung up on what the Latin root of a word might be. There's a lot of words we understand what they mean and they're not in the Bible like Trinity and Bible and Millennium. And the word ordained means people who are specifically appointed and set aside. Now, I was part of uh, a theology and ordination study committee that was priest in the sanctuary. Now, you know what you're going to hear people say? But today, Pastor Doug, in the New Testament, we are all a nation of kingdom and priests. The Bible doesn't say in the New Testament, when Peter makes that statement, he is quoting the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the sons and the daughters of Aaron were part of that tribe of priests. The sons and the daughters. But only the boys offered the sacrifice. And the girls had other important responsibilities connected to the sanctuary. It was different. And it's still different today. Yes, men and women are part of that royal priesthood, but their roles are different. Just like men and women are part of families, but their roles are different. Men and women procreate, but trust me, the roles are very different <laughs> in this. Yes, there's a lot of things we do together, but we have different offices. And it doesn't mean one is more important than the other. The Bible tells us God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. They're all authoritative. They're all united but the roles of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are different. So if somebody is rising up and saying, I don't like this idea that women don't have the same role as men, that it seems to be there's a submission in the Bible, well, you're also going to have to talk to the Lord and say, I don't like the idea that Jesus, while equal to the Father in his divinity, submits himself to the Father. Biblically, is submission a bad thing? But you have to ask yourself, the way it's being portrayed by some circles, it's almost like we're supposed to fight any kind of submission. Well, that's what the world would say. It's not what Jesus said. He said, I'm among you as one that serves. Christians ought to be fighting for positions of service. Not the highest position. The 70 elders appointed by Moses under God's direction were all male. E. Only men were anointed by God to serve as kings of Israel and Judah. One woman, Athaliah, forcibly tried to install herself in queen by killing her grandchildren, and she was later executed. F. The New Testament begins by tracing the genealogy of Jesus through the male lineage. Four famous women are mentioned in connection with their husbands. G. Jesus called only men to serve in the capacity of apostle. When Judas died, his replacement was chosen from among two men. How many were in the upper room in Acts chapter 1? 120. All men? 
men and women. But when they said, we need to replace Judas, why did they choose from among two men? Was it because they were stuck in the mud with some old cultural custom? Or was it because they knew that this was Jesus' pattern and they were following the pattern of Christ? While both men and women were baptized, you only find an example of men ever performing the rite of baptism. The first seven deacons ordained to administrate and to preach were all men. As Paul went from town to town appointing elders, he chose only men. And while two books in the Bible are named after women, most commentators agree that these books were all written by men. Peter says, holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. By the way, in the book Gospel Workers, page 92, Ellen White says, Through the Holy Spirit, God will open more clearly to those who will believe on Him who has inspired holy men to write concerning the truth. Both the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy says that too. Answer H-I-J-K-L. There are seven examples in the scripture of women giving birth in connection with a miracle. You know the miracle births in the Bible? All of the babies born that were types of Christ, they were all men. I believe the Lord could perform a miracle and have a, a girl baby born. But in this case, they were all uh, types of Jesus. Answer M, or point M, all patriarchal blessings were passed down from fathers to the sons. Pastor Doug, are you saying that the Bible is patriarchal? Yes. Is that a sin? No. I don't believe so. It's because I think men and women are different. I'll get to that in just a moment. In the 24 names inscribed in the foundation in the gates of the New Jerusalem are all male names. So you got the 12 tribes, you got the 12 uh, apostles, and they were all men. Now, is this a custom? Was it only because of culture? Did Jesus ordain 12 men because he was giving in to the cultural pressures of the day? Jesus got killed because he wouldn't give in to the culture, because he did speak against the hypocrisy and the things that were on. He said, you're putting your tradition ahead of the word of God. Jesus said, we need to go by the word of God. Why would he say all that and then go with a tradition and, and sacrifice it, especially in something that is supposed to be so important? So right now I'm going to elaborate a little more on these different 10 points I started with. Point number two, it's not supported by scripture. First I just showed you it's not supported by examples in the Bible. Now I'd like to show you I don't believe it's supported by the scriptures in the Bible. And I am not giving you a comprehensive Bible study. This is a quick study. And even these books that are much more, uh, you know, complete, there's a lot more. Dr. Raymond Holmes, one of our professors I greatly respect, he wrote a book about this years ago called The Tip of the Iceberg. That is a tremendous study. So you, you can probably still get some of those books. Genesis 3.16, God said to Adam, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And the word rule there means have authority, leadership. Now, I think that most of us will agree men and women are different. Typically, men are bigger and stronger than women. That's why you have different events in the Olympics. The reason for that was, through history, men were to be protectors and providers for the family. They were respected. With that came a very important responsibility to be servant leaders. But, and you know, in our culture today, think about it. This was what you call a self-evident truth for about 6,000 years. When you ran a farm, and a lot of the heavy work that people did before we lived in the industrial, mechanized, computerized age, men were actually appreciated back then. Because if a woman did not have a man to help her run a farm. She often became a poor widow. And Jesus had a lot to say about the poor widows and the orphans and how we were to care for them because they didn't have a husband who would fight for them and protect them and care for them. Even Peter refers to women as the weaker vessel. This is just the biblical self-evident truth. But now we're living in an age where because of police security, because most people used to live on farms, now they live in cities. Do you realize just in the last three years that changed? Most of the world used to live in the country. Now most of the world lives in the city. And we've got security cameras and mace. Who needs a man? Right? People, we, we've got our cars. You just step in, you turn a key, you push a button, you log on, you log off. You take your elevator. You press your panic button. 
They could dial 911. Who needs man? Right? And so just the thinking about the importance of men has changed in our culture from the days when that man was out following a horse or an ox, plowing a field, doing a lot of very heavy labor. Yesterday, Nathan and I replaced a, pens- a fence post behind our house. And it required us digging a big old hole in the ground, digging out a piece of concrete. Any of you men ever dug up an old fence post concrete stub that's left over in the ground? I don't want to be ungracious, but it would have been really hard for any woman here to pick that up. I was impressed when Nathan picked it up. I just got to tell you, it would have hurt my back. I've got proof that men and women are different. How many of you wives have handed a jar to your husband and say, could you please open this pickle jar? (laughs) Sorry, that's a bad example. (laughs) And so he made us different. Now let me give you one other verse. 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. This is in the Bible, but just bear with me. Paul said it. You know, it's interesting. People always quote what Paul says in Galatians 3, 28. There is therefore now no difference, male or female. And they don't quote everything else Paul says. Paul says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission and I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Let's just say, maybe we don't understand. Let's assume for a moment we don't understand everything that means. One thing you can't deny that we do understand is Paul is making a distinction between men and women. How many would agree that there is some clarity there? He says, women, men shouldn't do this or that and if you want to know how to apply that or where, let's not deny the basic truth. He says there's a difference. That at least is clear. Now here's his reason. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Paul is not saying, you know, this was just some Old Testament thing. Paul is saying that's the reason for the differences we still respect in the New Testament times. After Jesus died and went to heaven, we still have these differences that he said are part of the church. And he's, notice he says, for Adam was formed first. When Adam was formed before Eve, was there sin in the world yet? So even before sin, Paul is saying, God established that woman was to be the queen of the world, that man was to be the king. And it was understood that way. The Bible says, God created man from the dust, whereas woman was made from the man. God gave instructions to the man, not the woman, implying that the man was to pass these instructions on to the woman to be her instructor. The woman came from the man, not the other way around. The woman is made man's helper. It doesn't say man was made to help the woman, but though we should. Adam names the animals, and then he names the woman. Eve sinned first and then invited Adam to join her. I'm just stating some points and facts here. God addressed Adam with the question, where are you? He didn't ask Eve, where are you? Why? Because Adam was responsible. He was there to provide and to protect, and he failed in his responsibility. God drove Adam from the garden. Of course, we know that Eve went with him, but it says that he was the one who began suffering the penalty. The first pronouncement was against him. Men were supposed to provide and protect. Now, let me give you another verse. I've never heard anybody quote this um, in the debate, but, you know, I'm reading through the Bible all the time. And um, Numbers 36, and some of these, I appreciate Cheryl's putting these up on the screen for you. Numbers 30, verse 6. Speaking about vows. And it says, if indeed she takes a husband, a woman who is making a vow, if she takes a husband and while bound by her vows or by a rash utterance from her lips by which she bound herself and her husband hears it and he makes no response to her on the day that he hears, then her vow will stand. And her agreements by which she has bound herself shall stand. I just want you to pause here. That means people used to make vows and your vow was your oath you needed to keep that vow. It's saying that if a woman made an oath, women could make public vows and oaths, but if they make that vow, it must be ratified by the husband. How many of you remember when Hannah said, Lord, if you'll give me a son, I'll give that boy to you. Do you know the Bible says she went home and had to tell her husband that. Don't you think he needed to approve that? So listen to how it goes on. But if her husband overrules her on the day that he hears it, he shall make void her vow which she took and what she uttered by her lips by which she bound herself and the Lord will release her. Also any vow of a widow or a divorced woman by which she has bound herself will stand. In other words, if she is not in a family under the authority of a husband, 
that doesn't apply but when they're in the marriage relationship one needs to be the head to basically screen those kind of oaths that are going to affect the whole family the husband was the head now was this some old law that Moses dug up from antiquity and stuck in the Bible or did this come from the Lord did Moses pull this from Egypt and say that's a good idea let's just make everyone follow that or was this part of the Word of God that was given it's interesting to think about first Peter 3 1 to 7 likewise wives be in submission to your own husbands that if some do not obey the word they without a word might be one to the Lord by the conduct of the wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear for in this manner in former times holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord I'm not going to press that whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding giving honor husbands are to honor their wives as to the weaker vessel and being heirs together heirs together there's neither male or female when it comes to the right to everlasting life we are heirs together of the grace that your prayers may not be hindered so maybe there's some families listening that have had it, prayers hindered because we don't appreciate or respect the biblical model that God has lined up even though uh, Jesus says in Mark 3:27, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods unless first he binds the strong man he kind of establishes that men are to be the protectors in the families here hey we're making progress first Corinthians 14 I'm still talking about now the relationship between men and women in the family biblically and I'm just reading some of the verses there's a point I'm getting to. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. What law is Paul referring to? He's talking about the established scriptures of the day, which were the Old Testament. In other words, this is not a new truth. He's saying this is scriptural. That's why we follow this. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it's shameful for women to speak in church. And what that means was the women were contradicting their husbands, disrespecting their authority in the church when they were having these open debates regarding the truth. It is not saying that a woman can never speak in the church. Did Hannah, or did Anna rather, the, uh, in the temple of God, did she prophesy? Uh, you've got Deborah who was a prophetess. Um, you've got a lot of examples in the world, in the word, where women were proclaiming you've got the daughters of Philip that did prophesy and the word prophesied doesn't mean they went around and foretold the future what it means was that they were preaching and you've got um, Aquila and Priscilla they would give Bible studies together and so it's not saying that this is some mandate that women are never to preach but in the family there's to be a respect for the authority okay Ephesians 522 this was in our memory verse or scripture reading wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church that's pretty clear in other words if there's not been a change of Jesus being the head of the church then maybe there hasn't been a change of husbands being the head in the family and re regardless of some of the egalitarian propaganda that we hear he is savior of the body therefore just as the church is subject to Christ let the wives be to their own husbands and everything now this is not a license for men to be despots or tyrants and to be unkind or cruel in their families absolutely not the Bible says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church so that must be Christ like leadership and love for the Lord first Corinthians 11 3 but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ the head of the woman is man the head of Christ is God now as I read through these things it is amazing to me how clear the Bible is that there is a distinction of roles that is seen at least in the family. In a moment I'm going to show you why those distinctions of roles in the family transition to the church. But what's incredible to me is how I have heard a, a number of supposed scholars and philosophers take these verses and say, I know it says that, but it doesn't really mean what it looks like it says. Now that's true in some verses. 
I know occasionally when teaching different doctrinal truths there'll be a difficult passage you must explain. The rich man and Lazarus only appears once in the Bible. You gotta explain the thief on the cross. That only appears once in the Bible. There's some things that are difficult and you need to compare scripture and scripture. Let the Bible interpret itself. But if you're looking at a whole kaleidoscope of scriptures and say none of them mean what they look like they say, then maybe the scriptures don't need to change but our point of view needs to change. Or if you say they're much too complicated for the average person to understand, really that's not what Jesus tells us. He didn't go to the seminary at Jerusalem when he started the church, and maybe for good reason. He went to the shores to get the fishermen and the shepherds because he could speak simple truth to them and it couldn't be misunderstood. And when there was something difficult, they'd say, Lord, that's a hard saying. He'd explain it. All right. Colossians 3.18, wives submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. There's a fitting way. Now notice all these verses I've read about submission in the family. Submit to your husbands. Hebrews 13.17, in light of that, notice Hebrews 13.17 says, we should submit to our leaders. We should submit to our leaders. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who must give an account. Those who have spiritual leadership, your pastors, I hope you pray for them. The Bible says, be not many masters for you'll receive greater condemnation. We must give an account to God for keeping watch over your souls. That's why we're preaching the truth. But if you are to submit to your leaders and if your wife is a pastor, and a pastor, if you didn't know this, is not one day a week or a few hours once a week. A pastor is a pastor 24 hours a day then how is it that the husband is to submit to his wife who is the pastor 24 hours a day and yet she's told, no, no, you're supposed to submit to your husband. Then really you have no submission at all. You get, well, you get a mutual respect, but it's not talking about the biblical submission we read about in all those other verses. Do we all know that with sin in the world, sometimes even in a family there can be a difference of opinion and someone's got to call the shot? Someone has to make a decision. Now there are areas that I have delegated, I have freely given to my wife and say, you are the authority in these areas. I will respect your leadership in these areas. But you know what? She respects my leadership to recognize that. And then there are areas, and I suppose all of you have this in your marriage, then there are areas where she says, Doug, when it's this area, you're the boss. And she, she recognizes that. But men are to be the the last word, if you will, I know no one wants to hear that, but that's what I read in the Bible. If there is contention and you can't peacefully resolve it, the Bible says there needs to be one party submitting to the other's decision. What does the Bible say that should be? Uh, Titus 2 verse 4. I'm going to get letters on this sermon. I know I am. <laughs> Titus 2 verse 4. That they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And it used to be years ago that when a man wanted to marry a young lady, you know what he had to do? He had to go talk to her father. And during the wedding, some still do this, the father would lead the bride down the aisle and hand off to the man. And that was very symbolic and it goes back 6,000 years, what that all represented. That that daughter, he had been the protector and the provider of that daughter. And he was doing a transference of that position. Things have really changed. We are not in Kansas anymore. Did you know that? All right, so here's the question now. We've established the Bible's very clear that there's a distinction in the family. Does what happens in the family transfer to the church? I say, yes, it can't be any other way. Because in the Bible, many families were the church. If you're Abraham and you got 300 soldiers in your household and he was the priest for his family, he offered sacrifice for his family, how could he say, Sarah, tell you what, once the sun goes down, you're going to be the priest. And then after Sabbath, I'm the priest again. Or two missionaries go off in the mission field and you get two missionary families working together in some dark country to try to establish the truth and they don't really have a church building. They are the church. And to say, well, wife, you're to be the leader in spiritual matters when you're preaching, but in the home, then later I'm to be the spiritual leader. The Bible doesn't teach that you've got this kind of 
uh, thing where you're throwing it back and forth. Now, in my absence, when the kids were little in particular, and we have worship, Karen leads out in worship. But the Bible and the spirit of prophecy are extremely clear that the father, the husband, is to be the priest of the family. And that priesthood is then transferred to the church. You'll have confusion if you have one law and one scripture that you think is going to rule that in the church and a different one in the family. You transfer it. It's because the church is a family. Amen? This church is an extension to what happens in the families. 1 Timothy 3, let me give you some verses. Verse 4, criteria for an elder, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? God makes the connection. Let me give you from the book Child Guidance. Every family in the home life should be a church, a beautiful symbol of the church of God in heaven. That's page 480 in Child Guidance. Another one. In the home, the foundation is laid for the prosperity of the church. The influences that rule in the home life are to be carried into the church life. Did you catch that? The influences of the home life are transferred. They're carried into the church life. That's my life today, page 284. Every family is a church over which the parents preside. And this sanctified influence will be felt in the church and will be recognized by every believer. Because of the great lack of piety and sanctification in the home, the work of God is greatly hindered. No man can bring into the church an influence that he does not exert in the home life and in his business relations. All right, so what about the relationship between prophets and priests? Is there anything wrong with a person who might have one gift assuming the other gift? Can you find examples in the Bible where people said, you know, what difference does it make? I'm a king, I'm a prophet, I should also be able to do the same thing as the priest. You can re read in Exodus before you even get to uh, Samuel, the rebellion of Korah, Datham, and Abiram. You remember what happened? These were some men also from the tribe of Levi. You can read in Numbers 16, verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Kolath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the son of Eliab, and the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown, and they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and they said to them, you take too much upon yourselves, for all of the congregation is holy, every one of them. There shouldn't be any one ordained above another. We're all ordained. That's what they're kind of arguing. And the Lord is among them. Why do you then exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? How did God answer that question? He said, all right, I have called Moses and Aaron. I have ordained them. I have given them authority. You must respect the authority that I've given them. You don't pick. You can't go against my word. Finally, that movement of equality ended by the ground opening and swallowing the rebels alive. So if you have any wonder or question about how God felt about that. Then you've got the example in the Bible of King Saul. Samuel the prophet told Saul, wait seven days and I'll meet with you before you go to battle against the Philistines. Samuel was old, maybe he was a little late. Saul said, look, people are starting to get nervous and so it's expedient that I go ahead and sort of anoint myself priest. I will offer sacrifice before Samuel gets here because somebody's got to take charge. And, and he had a lot of really good, clever rationalizations why he should take the priest's office. After all, all the other kings also acted as priests in the other empires, the other pagan kingdoms. King, he could also be priest. It was only in Israel God said, no, no, I have specific people that are chosen by me to be priests. Someone entirely different might be king. And so Saul went and he offered sacrifice. Well, you know what happened? Samuel showed up right after that and he lost the priesthood. Or rather, he lost the crown. God said, I would have made your seed go on. But because you failed me in this respect, this is a great sin. So God meant what he said. How many of you remember King Uzziah? Uzziah was a king. Good king or bad king? The Bible says Uzziah, for the most part, was a good king, walked in the commandments of the Lord. But as he got proud, it says because of his pride, later in life, he thought, how come I can't do with the priest? Or how come I can't walk into the Holy of Holies? I'm the king. I can do everything. I'm the king. 
And he started thinking his rights weren't being respected. This is not fair. This is not just. And you're going to be hearing that. Fairness and justice. And was God discriminating? Yes, he was. Was God discriminating when he said only the sons of Aaron can be priests and only the sons of Levi can serve? Was God discriminating? Yeah. It was a discrimination of God. He said, I'm making a distinction. That's what discrimination means. And Isaiah said, God is not just, he's not fair, this is discrimination. He says, I'm going to go in to the sanctuary, I'm going to burn incense. And he got a censer and he put some incense and he went in and he said, see, I can do what the priests do, I do it just as well as them. They're not doing it any better than me. I've got a special gift for waving, waving this censer back and forth. I've been gifted for it, so I must be able to do it. And the priests all confronted him and said, what you're doing is wrong, king, this will not end well. And he got mad which shows you something was wrong with the spirit. Think about it. He lost his temper. Is that the right spirit? He wanted to be doing what the priests do and he got angry and lost his temper and he had a tantrum and the Bible says in his rage leprosy sprang out in his forehead. King Isaiah died living in isolation as a leper because he didn't respect that God has the right to say I have chosen this person and authorized this person and you must respect that and you cannot change that. You know, there's one name that is especially infamous in Israel. It is the name of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now, do you know how that usually ends, that verse in the Bible? Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. There's a few more words that go after that. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. It says it about a dozen times in the Bible. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. You remember who Jeroboam was? When the son of Solomon, his name is similar, Rehoboam. When he came to be king, the ten tribes from the north, they thought that Solomon pays too many taxes, they split and they rebelled and they said, let's pick our own king. We don't want to serve the sons of David anymore. And so they picked Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And Jeroboam became king up in the northern kingdom and he began to realize, now wait a second, these people are going to want to have forgiveness of their sins. They're going to have to go down to Jerusalem. Only temple was down there that Solomon had built and it was quite a temple. And he said, and the only priests are the Levites. Priests aren't going to participate if I make my own altar in my own temple. So I'm going to have to make my own altar but then I'll have to make my own priests to officiate in my temple because the Levites will not offer the golden calf I'm making. And so Jeroboam said, look, it's too far for you to go to Jerusalem. He made a golden calf. He set one up in Bethel. He set one up in Dan. He said, this is the God. It sounds like the Mount Sinai when they had the golden calf. And it says he made priests of the lowest of the people. And he said, it doesn't really matter whether you're children of Levi or sons of Aaron. He said, uh, I can make you a priest. What difference does it make? What difference does it make? Well, it does make a difference. Listen, I want to read something to you here. In 2 Chronicles 13 verse 9, there was a king, Abijah, who he confronted Jeroboam during a battle and they're talking across the valley. The king of Judah is about to go to battle with Jeroboam and the king of Israel after he's created this counterfeit religion. Don't forget, these were God's people and they, God's people, they were the church of God. They got mixed up on what God says in His Word and they did it their own way. Could that happen to God's people again? And so they're calling across the valley and the king of Judah, he said in 2 Chronicles 13, 9, Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and made yourselves priests like the peoples of other lands? Are we wanting to be like other churches, other denominations? That whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams, he can be a priest of things that aren't even God's. But as for us, the Lord is our God and we have not forsaken him. And the priests who minister to the Lord are the sons of Aaron and the Levites to attend to their duties. So God made a distinction and he expected that to, uh, to abide. You want me to keep going a little longer? I've got a couple more minutes here. All right. Another reason that I think this um, is very important, it's not supported by Seventh-day Adventist history. 
It's interesting that 30 years ago, virtually all of the professors in our seminaries all were united that only men should be ordained as pastors. Now, 60 or more percent are saying it doesn't really matter. My question is, what changed in the last 30 years? Did the Bible change? Did the truth change? Or did the culture change us? So that we're reading the Bible now with different spectacles on, and you can make it say whatever you want if you read it through the spectacles of culture. Let me read to you. This is from, you've heard of uh, J.A. Wagner, one of the leaders in their church. He was the editor for the Signs of the Times. This is an official magazine of the church that Ellen White endorsed and read. It was sent around. And this is uh, December 19, 1878. The divine arrangement, even from the beginning, is this, that man is the head of the woman. Every relationship is disregarded or abused in this lawless age. He thought it was bad back then. But the scriptures always maintain this order in the family relation. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 5.23 Man is entitled to certain privileges which are not given to woman. And he is subjected to some duties and burdens from which the woman is exempt. A woman may pray, prophesy, exhort, and comfort the church, but she cannot occupy the position of a pastor or ruling elder. This would be looked upon as usurping the authority over the man which is prohibited in the scriptures. Now, if Ellen White had ever said, Oh, Wagner, what in the world are you saying? Why did... Quite the opposite. She highly endorsed these things. This was our history. It wasn't until the last 25 years ago that this started to change. By the way, the Protestant reformers, even bless their hearts, the Catholic Church understands this. But you could look at Luther and Swingley and Melanchthon and Luther and Wesley and Calvin and Spurgeon and Matthew Henry and Adam Clark and John Gill and just go through any of the great reformers and the great Christian minds. They were all united. It was such a clear, self-evident truth. Some of them wrote very little about it because no one ever questioned it before. But now you know what some people are saying? Because certain things are not specifically prohibited, it must be permitted. That is the craziest argument I've ever heard. You're not going to find anything in the Bible that says don't smoke pot. I've had someone say that to me before. There's nothing in the Bible that says you can't smoke pot. But God gave us every herb of the field. That's why I've heard this. I have, really. And so they use the absence of a negative command as evidence to support something. That's not how you study the Bible. You don't look around and find out what you want to do and say, I don't see it forbidden in the Bible. That must mean it's a truth. But that's the kind of argument that you're hearing. The reason you see so little specifically forbidding it, you're not going to find a verse in the Bible that says women should never be ordained as pastors. Because it was a self-evident truth. You're not going to find that also in the spirit of prophecy. But you will find a lot of other evidence and I'll be sharing that. Let me give some of it to you right now. It's not supported by the writings of Ellen White. For those who are visiting... Ellen G. White is one of the founders, uh, we believe inspired uh, prophetess who was fundamental, she and James White and Joseph Bates and others in the formation of this worldwide movement. By the way, don't miss that we did okay with what our beliefs were for the first 150 years, going from virtually nothing to 18 million. Now as growth is tapering off and we're, com we're becoming more like the world in some ways, the answer is not to compromise with the world, it's to get back to the Bible. Ellen White says, in the work of setting things in order in all the churches and ordaining suitable men to act as officers and apostles held to the highest standards of leadership outlined in the Old Testament scriptures. That's in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 95. We are to hold to the highest standards of what? Of scripture. Again, she says here, and this is Adventist Review, uh, and Harold, we should heed the words of inspiration, lay hands suddenly on no man. We need to lift the standard higher than we have done to now. When selecting and ordaining men, she's very clear, ordaining men to the sacred work of God. 
You can read here from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. Eve had been perfectly happy in her husband, by her husband's side in her Eden home. But like restless modern Eves, she was flattered with the hope of entering a higher sphere.